Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. In January, the local St. Louis and St. Louis County chapters of the NAACP launched a literacy campaign by convening sessions with parents, school superintendents, university directors, and state education leaders. That initiative, called Right to Read, is a campaign that aims to get all children to fourth grade reading proficiency by the year 2030. Its particular focus on black students, however, lies in numbers. A report card out of the National Assessment of Education Progress shows that seven out of 10 Missouri students are not reading at grade four proficiency, and only one in black students reads at proficiency expected by fourth grade. Here to talk with us about Right to Read at the national level, we have Kareem Weaver. Kareem Weaver is co-founder and executive director of Fulcrum, an Oakland, California nonprofit that partners with stakeholders to improve reading results for students. He's also Oakland NAACP's second vice president and chair of its education committee. Kareem, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's get right to the right part. What is it that makes the ability to read a right and not a privilege the way getting a driver's license is? Well, there are some things that, um, regardless of what government entity sanctions it, um, we have a natural right to it. And that's access to basic resources, that's access to knowledge, that's access to health, you know, things like air and water. You know, you have a right to air. Mm -hmm. You you actually have a right to be able to breathe. Well, nowadays, economically speaking, sociologically speaking, familiarly speaking, you need literacy just as much as you need air. You need it in order to to be healthy physically, mentally, spiritually. It has to do with your economic health. It has to do with your familial health. You have a right to that. Whether or not whether or not you have a college degree, whether or not you have a lot of money, whether or not your family is, you know, um, well healed or not, you have a right to knowledge so that you can grow and, and then determine your own course after that. So that's why it's a civil right. It catalyzes all of the other rights that we have because we have to have it to function in literate society. Mm-hmm. And Kareem, you spent many years as a teacher in the classroom. Was there something that happened uh, that you saw happening with a student that really brought this this conviction and this connection of reading and rights uh, to you as something that just could not be ignored? Well, as most teachers would would tell you, it doesn't take long. You know, regardless of whether you're a high school, a middle or elementary school, uh, whatever public school, private school, charters. And you, if you spend a week in a, in a school building, you'll know that this is the coin of the realm and you'll realize that the struggle is real for the kids and the teachers who are trying to serve them. So for me, you know, it was just a matter of paying attention to what was going on around me. I worked in a juvenile justice facility first off in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and I saw young people there, you know, smart as they want to be, intelligent, but couldn't read, couldn't crack the code. And um, I actually took a bunch of kids to church. And the, the little old ladies in the Sunday school department told me, baby, did you know that these kids can't read? I said, yes, ma'am. I, I, I need some help if you have any ideas. She said, we got it. And she went about, they went about teaching kids to read. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was very old school, very traditional, but they did it. And that struck me because here are these people who were, as far as I remember, untrained. They weren't they weren't school teachers. They weren't principals. They weren't deans of education at some university. But they knew how to get kids, kids to read the letters and crack the code and to see the lights turn on. Mm-hmm. I actually had a child um, ask me, could he stay incarcerated longer? Because he was starting to read, was starting to figure it out, and didn't want to go back. Um, before he could get that skill mastered. 
So that was a light bulb moment for me. I knew that it was something that we had to wrestle with. And it also showed me that it's completely within our control. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are a lot of folks who say there are factors that limit our access to literacy. And sure, that's the case. But it doesn't mean that our kids can't do it with the right instruction and the right support. Now, to this point, Kareem, that you're making about instruction and where we expect it to happen, which is in schools, Mm -hmm. can you talk about how Right to Read is different from past efforts or campaigns around changing approaches to reading instruction? You know, Right to Read is actually saying, let's use the research consensus and the brain science um, that points to how kids learn best. So in the past, we, we may have done things that were popular at the time or was trendy. This isn't that. This is more of a, hey, let's actually do what works so that we can take care of our kids and so that our educators have a chance to serve our kids. Um, that means the school districts. That means the universities. That means uh, community groups like the NAACP and others have to be all going in the same direction. You can't have one or two groups going left while everybody else is going right. You can have robust conversation and debate, but at the end of the day, uh, my understanding of this initiative is we actually want to move in the same direction, which is what works best for kids, as rooted in the evidence around the country of what's working. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the NAACP, I'd like to introduce another voice into this conversation. Ian Buchanan is the St. Louis NAACP Education Chair. He's also a former school leader who holds a doctorate of education and is founder and CEO of NIA Education Group based here in St. Louis. Ian, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you for having me today. Excited. Well, Ian, as we heard Kareem describe a couple of light bulb moments for him, Um, We had talked earlier, and you said you were from the area, from East St. Louis. Is any of what Kareem was saying, uh, does it also reflect what you experienced and saw either as an educator or as someone who was growing up here in the St. Louis area? Absolutely. I think my first big revelation of the uh, importance of a literacy, specifically thinking about the methodologies that work with black students, was uh, my experience as an elementary principal. I had a chance to be an elementary principal for five years in the Pine Lawn neighborhood in the Normandy School District. Mm -hmm. And it was there where I really started to develop an expertise around the science of reading and how foundational literacy matters. And it really is one of the keys to access uh, to unlimited life opportunities for our students. And I think when we look at both parts of reading, in my opinion, reading is head work, but it's also heart work. And so that means not only must we use the best methodologies around uh, the science of reading, but we also must make sure that kids have a sense of belonging, Mm -hmm. that they see themselves in literature. We call it windows and mirrors, that that they see themselves and that they see others, and that they uh, have a level of high expectations, and we call the expectation archetype, we call it the warm demander approach. And so there are several things at work in terms of ensuring that our kids are literate by third grade and by fourth grade. Part of it is cognitive, part of it is affective. Mm -hmm. And my experience as an elementary principal gave me an opportunity to see the value of both. It's not an either or, it's a both and approach Mm -hmm. to ensuring that our kids are literate. And when was it that you were principal in Pine Lawn? Oh, I'm old, so it's hard for me to remember the the exact years, but I guess (laughs) it had to be around 2002, 2003. And the reason I'm asking this, I don't remember a time um, when reading was taught sort of absent of a focus on phonics and sounding things out. And yet, part of the reason we're having this conversation is that there has been another way of of teaching reading, and I use air quotes around that. Is that something, the, the whole language or sort of balanced literacy approach Is that something that you were familiar with from your training as a teacher or what you saw as an administrator, Ian, over the years? Absolutely. Uh, We have definitely seen the pendulum shift, uh, not just in St. Louis, uh, not just in the state of Missouri, but around the country. And I think uh, the attention 
was raised as a result of a, a very specific documentary that spoke to uh, the fact that some believe that we were sold a story about what works uh, with, in terms of educating students in the area of literacy. Kareem, can you speak a little bit to that about the science of reading? And you know, you as an educator, you said you noticed something, you took some kids to church, they learned how to read from teachers at the church. Ian, in your situation, you were talking about how you were approaching literacy with the students at the school um, you were leading in Pine Lawn. But how long did it take for for more people to see that the whole language approach was not working? And how was it that it gained traction in the first place? It's like chicken soup for the soul. That's why I gained traction. Uh, literacy instruction has to be rooted in love. And the whole language and the people who uh, promoted it really did a good job of packaging it as a caring, um, effective, affectively supportive, uh, just a loving approach. Uh, th- there is no wrong answer. Um, it, it, it's very fluid. It's very child-centered. It's very exploratory, and it feels good. And for a teacher force and an educator force that is predominantly comprised of individuals who reading came easy for them, they were part of the 5% that, you know, reading was almost, uh, I won't say natural, but they don't even remember how they learned to read. Then you have another 30% that um, they learned it somewhere, whether it be home or at school, but it, it still was relatively straightforward regardless of the method. So that's about a third right there, about 35% of folks. Well, those folks comprise about 90% of our educators. So it's difficult for them to perceive what the actual majority of people need, which is explicit, direct instruction. I mean, actually to be taught. So it was around the early 2000s, and it started in New York City. Um, not to throw stones in New York City, hope you don't mind, but um, uh, look, it, it just, it was attractive it, it, because it, it tickled our, our, our need to, to love and to want to hold and support students in a way that other things just did not. Unfortunately, it really wasn't rooted in the best practice on how kids learn to read. So early 2000, it really kicked up, early 2000s, it really kicked up steam, and by 2010, it was all the rage. The traction was, I mean, writ large across the board to the point where you have about 75% of schools using this method. That's the large majority of schools. And on top of that, um, once the graduate schools of education, your colleges and universities began promoting it, then there really was no bulwark against those methods. Um, And unfortunately, today in Missouri, just like all around the country, our universities are still um, using methods to instruct educators or prepare educators that are not according to the science. Because that's really the root cause of this. Our, our universities have a part to play here. It's their job to make sure that when folks go into the classroom, they're ready to go. We're talking about methods to improve literacy rates here in St. Louis and across the country. Joining me for this discussion is Ian Buchanan, Education Chair for the St. Louis NAACP, and Kareem Weaver, co-founder and executive director of Fulcrum, whose work is featured in the documentary, Right to Read. Kareem, how is Right to Read's approach to you know, putting parents and teachers together a step in the right direction? You're not going to turn literacy around in Missouri without teachers. It's just not going to happen. Um, vice versa, you're not going to turn around without parental support as well. That means talking to kids, developing their oral language skills, just the day-to-day things that we'll do, make sure that the kids are talking back to us and doing it in complete sentences. That means encouraging them. Ian talked earlier about the social-emotional factor. You know, it's tough when you're 13 to 18 years old and you really can't read. There is a there's a cost, a social emotional cost, and it wears you down. So who's going to keep the kids engaged? Who's going to encourage them to not give up? Who's going to continue to inspire them? Who's going to continue to make sure they're buoyed enough to still try? That's the parents. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the parents. That's the community. And so you have to work hand in hand. It, but it's so tempting to throw rocks at each other. It is. And as a parent and as a and, and as a person who has had a child with who has dyslexia. 
I know that sometimes we look at the institutional um, stakeholders and we say, this is your job. You should be getting it done. So there's a lack of empathy going both ways at times, but we have to shake that off. This is a time for grace. This is a time for growth. And this is a time to work together because if we don't work together, then nobody wins. The kids don't win. The people who serve the kids don't win. The community doesn't win. So in that sense, I'm hopeful that this leg legislation will build on that type of bond between community and school districts. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's some frustration out there. I mean, Ian can speak to it, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. And, and, and it doesn't mean that we don't have to do it uh, because we absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Ian. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. One is that, again, like Kareem mentioned, this is work that has to be done. And I think the second thing that I want to make sure that we double click on is when we talk about families and we talk about parents and caregivers, we come at it at this work from an asset-based approach. We don't believe in speaking to deficits and talking about what parents don't bring to the table. We believe that parents are the experts on their children. We respect the cultural capital that they bring to the table. And it's our job as educators to ensure that the relationships that we build are authentic, honest, and empowering to families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kareem, as we wrap here, I want to bring up something that I heard you say on a, a podcast that I heard you on recently. And you said that Ill illiteracy knows one color, green. Mm. What did you mean by that briefly? I'm glad you asked that question. We, we tend to look at the world through our tribal lens, whether they be ethnic, political, ideological, and so we, we look at this reading crisis, which, look, frankly, um, it, it spares none. And even those who are successful um, would, would argue that um, they have a long way to go. But we, we tend to look at it through racial lens. We look at it through color and class and, and uh, gender and race. And while those may very well be factors, the biggest factor is economics. And what I mean by that is this. If you have the money, you're not going to let your child fail. They'll struggle, then you'll get help. It's the money to identify the problem. It's the money to create solutions. And it's the money to say, you know what, not mine. I'm going to do what I have to. I'm going to spend the resources necessary to make sure my kids are going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of folks in the area just don't have that kind of money. So it's it's really the, the modern day Mason Dixon line. It's the dividing line between the haves and the have nots, the fortunate and the unfortunate. It is it is really a, a wall that's so difficult to get over. But but recognizing that and being honest about it is the first step. And so when we look at some schools and some districts that are doing better than others, we say, okay, well, what are the economics of that community? And how many of those parents have gone to outside services for support with their children's reading? You know, the, the survey that nobody really wants to give is the PTA survey that asks, hey, do you provide private tutoring for your child? And how much money do you spend on that? That's the green color that I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. I want us to make sure that we, we, we recognize that this is an all of us issue because even if you have the money, it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to spend it in that way. Mm -hmm. You may have other needs and family obligations and duties and responsibilities. So everyone has a stake in this, but it's, it's not just a matter of race. Class matters and the ability to access supports and services absolutely matter as well. So that's why I say the real color of this is green. Mm -hmm. And Ian, to the point that Kareem is making about people moving schools and options and that sort of thing, I think that is very relevant to the situation that we have in St. Louis. And we started this segment talking about why there is a focus on black children. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. We're not just talking about black children in uh, some of our zip codes that have um, uh, lower uh, social uh, median social uh, or median incomes. Even in our more, more affluent districts in our region, black students are underperforming. So let's not act like this is a rich, poor problem because that's part of it. But what we have in our region 
uh, if we were to actually disaggregate and drill down some of our performance data, black kids student uh, black kids' performance scores are actually going backwards in some of our more affluent districts, and part of that is because they are not committed to the science of reading. And so you can be a black kid in a rich community and still be underserved just as you can be in some of our more vulnerable communities in our region. So mm -hmm. let's not play games and think that this is a rich, uh, poor thing only. Black kids are being underserved everywhere in our region and typically everywhere across the United States. Mm -hmm. And as we wrap here, Ian, I mean, why does the success of this campaign, which has that 2030 goal, why does it matter to all of us in St. Louis, whether it's city or county, and whether or not we have or work with school-aged black children? Yeah. So if you're a person that's guided by morals, then this is a moral issue. We owe it to all children to ensure that they have what they need to flourish and thrive. If you are motivated by economics, if kids can't read, we don't have a workforce. And so for those two reasons, pick your poison. Kids deserve it and our region deserves it. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Recorded by Maya Norfleet. Podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.